introduce myself just to say that uh, I've been working with IID for about five years in, um, in a team a group working on conservation and biodiversity from a sort of people perspective. Prior to that, I worked with CARE International and briefly with BirdLife International and within CARE for a long time worked on environmental issues in a team where we had got, um, gender uh, experts, but more broadly, during the time I worked there, CARE moved from being, uh, you might say, gender centered to having a gender transformative ambition. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of refer back to that on, in relation to some of the, the, the things I've to say. So, yeah. yeah. So, I'm going to talk about uh, three case studies and, in particular, focus on two big issues. Um, one is the uh, issue of gender equity and equality and what we mean by those and how we have sort of made a transition from one to the other. Um, the question of why, the second one is, is essentially a question of why gender equality from a conservation perspective. Um, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to talk about those issues in the context of three case studies, two very specific um, initiatives. First, it's the first two, and they happen to be in, in Kenya. Um, and then the last one is a broader, uh, much broader look at a whole sector of community forestry in Nepal. Um, so, to move, start with the first one. This is a, a forest on the coast of Kenya. Um, I was working there and we had a study that was uh, organized by AWF on the Butterfly Farming Initiative, which was one of those sort of classic alternative livelihoods initiatives. Um, and it was looking at the viability of the initiative in general and the impact of it, but had quite a lot of interesting things to say about uh, women and um, the impact on women and how to increase that. So this is an important source of income, not for a lot of people, but about 100 in the area. Uh, and it's particularly suitable for women as, as you raise these butterfly, the pupae of the butterfly at home in cages uh, in the compound. And so you don't have to, you, if you've got young children, you can do, do it while you're looking after the children. Um, and so it was reviewed by. So, um, some of the observations on this initiative, particularly from a gender perspective, were that the enterprise, this, this enterprise, they're raising these pupae of butterflies and selling them to uh, a, a project which then sells them on to international markets for people to put in butterfly houses. So this was an initiative controlled by men, um, the, basically the unit of, through which the project interacted with People was the household, and naturally they spoke to the household head. So most times, although uh, women were actively involved in it, they weren't the contact point, and it was seen, therefore, uh, by the project to be a sort of male enterprise. Um, they commented very uh, interestingly in referring to other research that if you assume that it could be men or women doing this particular enterprise, that income accruing to women was generally spent more wisely on things like school fees and income accruing to men, which in that area is a lot of it spent on um, palm wine. Now that's a rather extreme example, but that has been observed in a number of other cases. I think there's a paper by Amartya Sen that talks about altruism, but um, that was an observation on, on, from the specifics of this particular case study. Uh, on the conservation impact, the idea with these alternative livelihoods activities is that people are generating income are, are from an enterprise that is to some extent dependent on the forest and therefore it would make people more supportive of conservation. And that indeed was observed in terms of the political threats to the forest of, of de sort of degazettement, of removing parts of the forest, but there was no evidence of any reduction in legal activities per se by individuals, but very clear evidence of a big comparing uh, people who were involved in the enterprise with others, big difference in, the, in their attitude to the forest. And lastly, the observation that uh, you had a choice, basically. You could run the enterprise with relatively few people growing a lot of these pupae, 
or the other extreme, hundreds of people, small producers who might be particularly poorer people or particularly maybe women, women and that will cost you quite a lot more to run because you need a lot more extension agents. So there is a cost to uh, this uh, a more gender responsive or poor approach. So in the in the conclusions, you could say that prior to the review, uh, this was at best gender sensitive, um, and in terms of our uh, equity framework, it wasn't really looking at any aspect of equity. Uh, it simply observed that there were men and women who produced pupae, but they worked mainly with the men. So this changed to a responsive um, approach, deliberately trying to encourage more women to get involved in uh, interacting with them directly rather than through the men, and, and so there was that, that change. Um, that was expected, as I said, impact to generate more benefits for women and probably a larger contribution to human well-being as a result, given the spending sort of pattern of women and men there. Um, that it was expected this would have no conservation impact, increasing the number of women involved, and maybe even negative impacts on, on conservation for the reason that um, women have no voice, political voice in that area. So if the if the pathway to conservation impact was through men being incentivized to sort of raise their voices in local fora and sort of ask their MPs to support forest conservation, that did not happen with women because they're not in those fora and they don't have a, a voice. So there was a possibly a trade-off there between more benefits for women and, and the conservation objectives, or, although that was never sort of specifically discussed, but it seemed to be a significant uh, question. And lastly, as I said, it, might, it would probably cost more to certainly set up the project and even probably to sustain it over time if you want to have a more gender responsive approach because you'll tend to be dealing with more smaller scale producers um, and, and that will it, it require more investment, at least in the startup. So um, that's the butterfly project. Um, the next case study, also from Kenya, is something very recent. So the Butterfly Project was 1998, that assessment was done. This is 2017, done by myself and Francesca, uh, well, supported by myself and Francesca. This is uh, in a conservancy in Kenya, Mara North, which has recently established, and it borders the Masai Mara National Reserve. Uh, it has uh, comprises of land owned by 700 individuals and they're individually titled but they, they manage this as a group. Um, it has a very high income from lots of tourist hotels and camps, at least $1,000 per household per year. And it's a sort of joint venture in terms of governance between the indigenous community, the Maasai and, and the private sector tourism operators. And what we were doing there was supporting them to do an assessment of the governance of the conservancy, on the, particularly looking at issues of participation and decision making, transparency and benefit sharing. So they did the assessment, we helped um, to train them how to do it, and, and the facilitators were also local, from locally around. Um, so, just to show you this, so this is looking at, as I said, very much at decision making, access to information and benefit sharing. There were a number of interesting observations related to uh, gender e equity, stroke equality. Um, the first and most obvious one was they had an overall decision-making committee uh, of 19 people. There were no women on that committee. Even on the subcommittees that allocated benefits, like school bursaries, there were again about 20 people, not a single woman in that committee either. Um, so that became very uh, obviously a problem and they agreed that they would uh, make those decision-making bodies at least a third women and that has been done um, in terms of the quantity, the numbers, but uh, not yet in terms of the quality because they haven't done a proper election process so they've kind of co-opted women uh, in who were probably friends of the men that stepped down to make space for the women. So, there's still quite a big issue there. It's a move in the right direction. With uh, information gathering, um, women knew, knew nothing about the Conservancy. In fact, the fact that a large part of their family land had been 
uh, committed to this conservancy and therefore excluding uh, grazing, certainly of their animals, uh, they knew nothing about it, nothing about the lease arrangements, nothing about their rights, and in fact many of them had never been invited to any meeting about the conservancy. So when we went there, they observed it was the first meeting that they had on that topic. Um, so that it was agreed that definitely they need to be more involved and, and, and uh, get more access to information and specifically to attend the general meeting once a year. It remains to be seen whether that will happen. Um, limited, this is on the benefit side, limited employment opportunities for women in the Conservancy in all these hotels and lodges. Um, there was an agreement that the board of the Conservancy would take this up and put in place. That's where the community and the partners work together in joint governance. They would come up with an affirmative action strategy to increase women's employment. Um, and lastly, the women observed that it didn't seem to be fair that men can graze their cows in the Conservancy, but they can't graze their sheep. The men said that there should be no action on this because grazing sheep is incompatible with conservation, whereas grazing cows is compatible with conservation. Um, and that simply illustrates, and that closed down the conversation basically, and illustrates. Although there is um, a space for this discussion, and, and the men definitely were open to a number of quite progressive ideas, this wasn't one of them. Um, and they backed it up with what they said was science that made that case. So um, we, you know, they're, they're, uh, the progress is basically at the highest, uh, the number one most progress down to the, the fourth issue, no progress. Um, the, the, but fundamentally, and I think uh, Helen referred to this, some of the proposed actions fundamentally challenge traditional norms of Maasai culture. One reason why that is even possible is because the Kenya constitution has changed recently and, uh, in, and says that a third of all women should be, um, uh, on committees should be a third women minimum. Land can be owned by women in their own right and various other very progressive provisions in the new constitution. Um, so prior to this assessment, Definitely, the, uh, the, there was no even talk of, of men and women, it was just um, the members. Uh, uh, and that's how the, the tour operators and everybody referred to people, was the, the, the people, the members of the community. Um, gender blind, now that's definitely moving in some respects to be responsive. So that at least responsive would be uh, looking at how the benefits are, are distributed and trying to do something to make that fairer and in this case, uh, affirmative action in favour of women in, in employment. Uh, potentially transformative is only possibly the first one if the women who are properly elected to this committee and people listen to them and actually enable them to have influence, then it would be becoming transformative in, in the change. Um, yeah, so I'll move on to the third one, uh, which is a much uh, larger kind of case study. And I, I've been involved, uh, not, not living in Nepal, but working through when I was with CARE. Over many, many years, they had a big program supporting community, community forestry, and particularly governance of community forest user groups in Nepal from um, the mid-90s onwards. So uh, when, you, when you look at the program in Nepal, it now has more than 20,000 community forests, mostly almost entirely natural forests. Uh, more than um, a quarter of all the forests in Nepal is in these community forests under this arrangement. So you can see and when people use these terms, the first generation, second generation and third generation. So the first generation, the government started to hand over forests, as they call it, hand over to communities. Because the forests were so degraded, they hardly worth anything to government anymore and they thought they really had nothing to lose. And they were really quite successful in conservation terms. And the only aspect in which there was some kind of discussion of gender was in the membership of the actual group that manages the forest, where uh, women were encouraged to join in their own right as well as men. So it was not on, on a household basis and uh, the decision making, but not in decision making committees. So, and there was a lot of the lead capture of benefits, um, a lot of exclusion of vulnerable people who had been very forest dependent who were uh, often from a bit further away, they were shut out, including some women who experienced those negative impacts as well. So in some respects, the first generation 
was actually bad news for women in a number of places. That was began to be recognised towards the end of that period, and there was a, a new policy, there was a big workshop in Kathmandu, and they decided they needed to address these issues of social exclusion um, and, uh, and the gender issues. And um, so they, there were some policy changes, such as the first saying that 30% of committees have to be, members have to be women. Um, they tried to deal with some of the uh, elite capture. Um, they uh, partially successfully in some areas, but still major problems existing. Um, there was this evidence that forests, uh, they encouraged women groups on their own to take up forest conservation, and those forests actually did better than uh, the other ones that were managed by mixed groups, and there's some strong evidence for that. And their overarching cross-cutting theme around gender was called gender and social equity, and, and that kind of it. Uh, and then the third generation, again, is trying to address the issues that were found to be still problematic in the first generation of the uh, uh, of women uh, largely not um, having any influence other than the women only forests and still a lot of elite capture benefits. So the third generation again, there are policy changes which are progressive and, and, and sort of affirmative. And um, very recently, the government and all the, all the donors and major NGOs have adopted what they call gender equality and social inclusion, as opposed to gender and social equity. And this has become fully formally integrated in the forest policy in 2015. So what does all this mean? Well, so, and there's a lot of interesting uh, work being done on gender and forestry in Nepal, perhaps as much or perhaps more than most other countries. And one of the things I looked at, because uh, I was reading around this as well, was the uh, PhD, which basically looked at how this first, second, third generation maps onto the, the change in the way the gender has been addressed in an environmental context over time. So in the 80s and 90s, you had this, certainly when I was in care, we talked to women in development or women in, the, in environment and development paradigm. So this is based on the idea there's some kind of special relationship between women and nature and that women have a natural interest in protecting forests and that harnessing these interests and skills and etc could be make forestry more efficient that's sort of an instrumental argument um, although these studies have showed that the, these forests often had negative impacts on women but this was the, the, the sort of strong paradigm of that period um, the second generation try to address some of the problems by emphasizing by working on governance and women's empowerment. Um, and there were some, some successes in areas where, which had strong external support, like, like through care that I was working for at the time. There were several thousand of the, the groups had that kind of support, but 18,000 of them didn't. And, and, and there are still a lot of problems, as recent studies have shown. Um, one of these sort of analysis of why it has been so difficult beyond these islands of sort of NGO support is the, the very fundamental point that this relationship between women and, and forest management conservation is conditioned by pre-existing gender, gender relations, whereas the assumption of many NGOs was that the entry point was working through these forest governance groups and empowering women within that context, whereas it's just saying that actually these external gender, this whole the dynamic within society is the thing that shapes all of this. And if you just focus on forest governance, you're not going to make much progress. Um, but anyway, there was some benefit from the second generation with increased benefits um, to women. The conservation impacts, um, uh, Helen's already referred to this paper by Alicia et al. 2017, and one of his sources is this. Uh, paper which showed that not only the women only groups but also the mi mixed groups with a high proportion of women tended to have better forest condition and here uh, they attributed that to rule, better rule compliance or accountability in these mixed groups women's knowledge and also the, the, the fact that there is tends to be stronger cooperation amongst women so collective initiative maybe works better if there are uh, uh, a good number of women within that within that group so as, as you see uh, this evolving from the first to the second to the third, you can pretty much map that onto this um, 
sort of continuum of sensitive to responsive to transformative, where the responsive in the language of Nepal equates with equity and the transformative equates with equality. So finally, just to uh, wrap that up, now I'm not going to read through all of this, but the definition for, um, just to say that formally, and these definitions are taken from the UN Women uh, website, uh, a glossary of terms, and um, the equality um, being a, a, a human rights issue, and um, it refers to uh, equal rights and responsibilities and opportunities, uh, very clearly equal, uh, to be equal, um, the gender equity being a notion of fair treatment of women and men, and then they note that, uh, that this involves an interpretation of the concept of justice, or and, it, and it's usually based on local uh, context, which is often, most often to the detriment of women. So, that's why um, the Beijing uh, conference in the mid-90s uh, came down strongly against using this term and discouraged organizations to, from using it. Um, the term that Helen mentioned about intersectionality is becoming really important in Nepal and their new strategy of gender equality and social inclusion, meaning that um, an individual's identity is conditioned by many things, one of which is gender, um, but others being um, uh, access to resources and, and, and power relations that are based on uh, religion, ethnicity, caste and class. And in fact, it is going to be more effective to recognize this complexity rather than try and sort of make, uh, take a sort of reductionist approach. Uh, and so that, um, lastly, um, looking at, so looking and taking a step back and, and looking at this issue of gender equality and equity in the context of conservation. Um, and there, now, when I look in literature from CARE, it says that gender equity is a step towards the ultimate goal of equality. However, in the equity framework that we've been referring to, which we've been uh, developing with a number of people, in which it relates to the context of conservation, and it relates to relationships between many different actors, state and non-state, which will not always be equal. So in a broader framing of equity and conservation, some of the factors that determine how you allocate benefits, or even how you, what access people have to information or decision-making platforms, is based on rights, it could be based on costs incurred, so say there's a big problem with elephant damage, people who are, who are experiencing that problem may have preference in being involved in a certain process, their contribution to conservation goals, or, and this is the last one, is needs, basically, um, their particular needs are, that are related to poverty rather than conservation per se. So, so in, in the context of conservation, you can see that in, in, uh, in the sort of domains of recognition and procedure, which is all about recognizing rights and, and, and the governance issues of participation, accountability, etc., the norm tends to be gender equality, and we don't see many cases where where men and women are treated separately. But in the domain of distribution, there, is much, there are much more differences related to those, those bullets above. But, and in the context, therefore, in the context of conservation, we tend to see equality as one variant of equity that applies very much in the recognition and procedure, almost um, universally in those dimensions, but not necessarily in the dimension of distribution. So you have a kind of conundrum between the way that people are in conservation might see the relationship of these two and the, relation, and the way that others in the more in the, sort of, in the gender world in other sectors might see them. Um, lastly, and that's a question, how do we, um, I guess I've tried to explain that here. Uh, the last question is um, related to the, my, my, my point about moral and instrumental arguments for why we need to address gender equality. And, um, so it, you can also say, is, is gender equality considered a goal of conservation, or simply a means or an instrumental pathway to achieving better conservation? 